In 2021, news outlets started buzzing once again with something new. China was building yet another mysterious structure in the middle of the Gobi Desert. At first glance, it didn't raise too many eyebrows. After all, China is no stranger to grand-scale construction projects in the middle of nowhere. But this time, it wasn't a solar farm or a military testing site. It turned out to be a nuclear power facility. Still not surprising? Fair enough. China already has dozens of nuclear plants scattered across the country. But dig a little deeper, and things start to get a lot more interesting. Because this wasn't just any nuclear reactor. This one was powered by a rather obscure element, thorium. And the more you learn about it, the more it starts to feel like something out of a science fiction novel. Back in 1828, the Swedish chemist Johns Jacob Berzelius discovered a new element and gave it a name that sounded straight out of Norse mythology. He called it Thorium, after Thor, the god of thunder. On the periodic table, Thorium sits with the actinides and carries the atomic number 90. It's a silvery metal, slightly radioactive, and it turns out, it might just hold the key to revolutionizing nuclear energy. Now, if the word radioactive makes you uneasy, don't worry, thorium is radioactive, but only mildly. That's because all naturally occurring thorium is thorium-232, an isotope with a half-life so long it stretches the imagination. To put it in perspective, thorium-232 has been around since before the Earth was even formed. Some scientists believe it predates the solar system itself, possibly even going back to the aftermath of the Big Bang. And billions of years later, it's still decaying, very slowly, because of its low-level radiation. Thorium is surprisingly safe to be around in small concentrations. In fact, it's found in beach sand all around the world. One of the most common minerals containing thorium is called monazite. This mineral can contain anywhere from 3.5% to 10% thorium by weight. That might not sound like a lot, but when you consider the sheer volume of monazite-rich sand in certain parts of the world, it adds up. So, how much thorium do we actually have access to? Well, thorium is far more common than you might think. In the Earth's crust, it's found an average of 10.5 parts per million. For comparison, tin, a metal we use all the time, is present at only 2.3 parts per million. Even gold, that famously precious metal, only appears at about 1.8 parts per million. Thorium is, relatively speaking, everywhere. When it comes to national reserves, India holds the top spot. The country has about 340,000 tons of thorium, most of it in its western coastal regions, where monazite sands are abundant. China isn't far behind with roughly 280,000 tons of industrial reserves. But there's an important difference. India's thorium is mainly found in beach sands, while China's thorium is buried deeper and not mined directly. So how is China getting its hands on so much thorium? Here's the clever part. China doesn't need to mine thorium directly. That's because thorium is a byproduct of rare earth mining. And in the world of rare earth elements, China is the undisputed heavyweight champion. As of 2023, China produced 70% of the world's rare earth elements and processed about 90% of them. These materials are essential for making everything from smartphones and electric vehicles to wind turbines and guided missiles. And the epicenter of this production is a massive operation in Inner Mongolia, the Bayanobo Mine, located about 93 miles northwest of Baotou, spread over 19 square miles. It holds a majority of China's rare earth reserves and one of its key minerals is, once again, monazite. After extracting the rare earth elements from monazite, what's left behind is usually discarded as waste. But that so-called waste contains significant quantities of thorium. So, thanks to its booming rare earth industry, China ends up with a steady, almost effortless supply of thorium. This gives the country a serious strategic advantage. Thorium has a variety of uses. It's added to metal alloys like magnesium and aluminum to improve their strength and heat resistance. It's also used in welding electrodes and even in high-end optical lenses, where it helps increase light refraction. These applications are helpful, but they pale in comparison to thorium's most promising use, nuclear power. The idea of using thorium as nuclear fuel isn't new. Back in the 1960s, American scientists at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee experimented with a completely different kind of nuclear reactor, one that didn't rely on uranium or plutonium. Led by nuclear pioneer Alvin Weinberg, Researchers develop a reactor that ran on uranium-233, which isn't found naturally but can be produced by irradiating thorium-232 with neutrons. Over time, thorium-232 absorbs a neutron, undergoes a few decay steps, and becomes uranium-233, a fissile material capable of sustaining a nuclear chain reaction. Between 1965 and 1969, Oak Ridge ran an experimental molten salt reactor for a total of 15,000 hours. It used a mixture of fluoride salts with thorium dissolved into the solution, producing nearly 8 megawatts of thermal power. 
It was a major technological breakthrough, but the world wasn't ready. The materials needed to handle the high temperatures and corrosive nature of the molten salt weren't available at the time. Additionally, the U.S. nuclear industry had already committed to uranium-based solid fuel reactors, which were better understood and aligned more closely with military needs. The thorium reactor was shelved and largely forgotten, until now. Fast forward to 2021. Deep in the Gobi Desert, about 75 miles from the city of Wuhei, China successfully built and tested a new molten salt thorium reactor. For the first time since Oak Ridge, a thorium-powered system achieved stable nuclear fission. The Chinese reactor isn't huge. Its thermal output is just 2 megawatts, and it doesn't yet generate electricity. But that's about to change. China plans to scale up and build a new reactor with a thermal capacity of 60 megawatts and an electrical output of 10 megawatts. These are still small by commercial standards, but they mark a significant milestone. You might be asking, why go through all this trouble? Why not just stick with tried-and-true uranium reactors? There are several compelling reasons. First, China is concerned about long-term uranium supply. The country has over 50 nuclear power plants that together generate roughly 400 terawatt hours of electricity per year. That accounts for about 5% of China's total energy production, which, given China's massive demand, is a substantial chunk. And it's only the beginning. Between 2005 and 2020, China added about 3.4 gigawatts of nuclear capacity annually. From 2020 onward, they've increased that goal to 9 gigawatts per year. Clearly, the country is betting big on nuclear, and that means finding alternative fuels is crucial. Thorium is three times more abundant than uranium. According to some estimates, China's thorium reserves alone could power the nation for up to 20,000 years. That kind of energy security is hard to ignore. And there's more. China, like much of the world, is pushing toward zero emissions. The country is investing heavily in solar, wind, and hydropower, but these sources have limitations. Nuclear energy, on the other hand, is dense, reliable, and carbon-free. While traditional uranium reactors have long raised concerns about safety and nuclear waste, thorium-based systems offer promising solutions. For one, they produce far less long-lived radioactive waste. The molten salt design is also considered inherently safer. If the reactor overheats, the fuel can drain into a containment vessel and cool off naturally, avoiding meltdowns. So, what China is doing in the Gobi Desert isn't just another mega project. It's a potential leap forward in how humanity generates clean, abundant energy. With the world facing increasing pressure to decarbonize and reduce its reliance on fossil fuels, thorium might just be the underdog we've been waiting for. And if that's the case, we'll be seeing a lot more quiet revolutions beginning in the desert.